My name is Karen Hart, and I'm with Occupy Missoula, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. I'm Doug Henwood. I edit the Left Business Observer uh, based in uh, Brooklyn, a uh, newsletter on economics and politics, and do a radio show and uh, blog now and then, although not obsessively, at lbo-news.com. Um, I guess I just wanted to start with what information you think is important for the members of our movement in terms of the economic issues that our movement is interested in. Yeah, well, I want to first say um, it's just uh, splendid to see uh, this, uh, what's, what's been going on. I've you know, been down to Zuccotti a few times and also uh, was at Times Square yesterday. And it's, it's been really inspiring. I've been writing about these sorts of issues, inequality and the bloated financial sector for about 25 years. And uh, sometimes I felt like I was just you know, talking into the dark. Uh, but now uh, the way that this movement has brought these issues to the center stage uh, is just uh, really wonderful to see it spreading around the world. You know, it's just the, the news zipper in Times Square yesterday we were standing there and it says, Occupy Wall Street spreads around the world. I thought, well, this is just uh, quite wonderful. Yeah, uh, and we should, we should so, mention you wrote a book. Uh, I did a book called Wall Street, How It Works and For Whom, uh, which is now available for free download. Uh, the uh, the publisher decided not to reprint it, so the copyright reverted to me, and now it's uh, on the web at wallstreetthebook.com for free download. And uh, obviously very relevant to our issues. I know Mike Consul has cited it a number of times as something that's, you know, really relevant to what our movement obviously is interested in, given that it's an Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah, one of the points I make in the book, which is kind of central to it, is that Wall Street, you know, the, the standard line is that Wall Street is all about raising money for productive activity. It links savers and investors. It doesn't really do very much of that. Uh, what uh, most corporate investment is financed by the corporations themselves through their cash flow, uh, through their profits. They don't really know to go outside for money very much. All the apparatus that's grown up around uh, Wall Street is mainly uh, to make money off money. Um, and th that basic you know, sort of fundamental use of Wall Street is, is remarkably small in comparison to all the speculation that, and, and the, the froth that goes on around it. Uh, it's really uh, a system uh, for uh, the creation of an owning class. Um, it's really a very political system. Through the me mechanisms of the financial markets, uh, it, it, they, they create, through stocks and bonds and other instruments, uh, claims on other people's labor, essentially. I mean, the people who uh, own corporations don't run them. Uh, they hire professional managers to do that. Uh, and one of the points uh, that I take uh, from Marx in, in, in developing Wall Street is that the fact that now that corporations are separated between owners uh, and uh, managers, uh, between uh, the people who actually run them day to day, are a different set of people from the people who, theor who legally own them. That means the owners are a completely useless class. They're a completely parasitical class. It means that Workers could run the companies themselves. It means that uh, they could hire managers, professional managers, uh, to run the things. Uh, but the, the, the whole shareholder class, much of Wall Street, serves absolutely no useful economic function anymore. Uh, all they do is take money out of enterprises. They don't really put very much back into it. Uh, so that, that's one of the, the central points I'd like to make. The other thing is that I, I think... Um, uh, so much money is accumulated in the top of this society. Uh, you know, the, one of the things I love about this 99 versus 1% thing is that even though it's perhaps literally not mathematically true, it's pretty close to being literally mathematically true. And it's politically wonderful because it, uh, it, it, it just unites a large group of people, uh, from you know, professional class people to unemployed people. I mean, it's, the bottom 90% of American society has seen almost no benefit of economic growth over the last three decades. Uh, the top 10, you know, the, maybe the next 9% have done okay, but the really, the really big guys have been the top 1%, and within the top 1%, 0 0.1 and 0 0.01. The further you go up, when you get up to the Forbes 400, who barely, you know, register as a percentage, uh, they've just been making out like bandits. I mean, it's just been an amazing uh, a shift of money to the top of society. And this has been a conscious strategy. Uh, if we go back to the 70s, uh, there was an effort to uh, break workers. Uh, you know, the, the, the elites in the 70s got very, uh, very frustrated uh, that workers were in a bad mood. Uh, people were walking off the job. There's a lot of wildcat strikes. Internationally, uh, the third world was in rebellion, and commodity exporters were, were, were raising prices, particularly for oil. So the elites in the late 1970s said, we've had enough of this, and launched a big crackdown, uh, created a 
a deep recession in the early 80s through Paul Volcker at the Federal Reserve. Uh, then Reagan came into office, uh, and so there's a tremendous pressure on, on wages uh, and breaking unions, uh, cutting benefits, and scaring the daylights out of regular people. It's been a very, very successful class war from above, and it's now finally uh, very refreshing to see after all these three decades or so, to see the, the, the people from below being to fight a class war. Uh, so all this money that's accumulated at the top of society, at the same time, basic needs are going unmet for, the, for much, you know, almost everybody, really. Uh, even you know, professional people have no job security. They're frightened. Uh, people who thought you know, 10, 20 years ago that they'd settled to something secure or find themselves subject to layoff or downsizing or 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 cut back in hours or wages. You know, it's just been a remarkable broad assault on the living standards of regular people. Uh, and I think what we need to do is mobilize to change that state of affairs. Um, one of the themes that people keep talking about over and over again uh, is the growth of debt. Uh, one of the reasons for that growth in debt is because of that class war from above, that, that repression of wages uh, and the, the, the pressure on living standards, meant that people, in order to maintain even the semblance of a middle-class standard of living, have had to borrow very uh, heavily. Uh, and that worked for a long time. Um, it kept the political pressure off. Uh, it, uh, but I think that we've, that's now run out. The financial crisis of 2007-2008 means that that borrowing outlet is gone. Uh, so what we're, one of the reasons that the economy is so weak is that uh, it reveals the fact that people cannot live on their own paychecks. If they can't borrow aggressively, uh, uh, and uh, you know, all these tales about people having consumption binges is completely not true. I mean, the consumption share of the American economy has not grown all that much. People in the bottom 90% of the population have not been binging uh, in, in a consumption binge. They've been borrowing to pay college tuition. They've been borrowing to get their teeth fixed. They've been borrowing if they have any kind of medical emergency. Uh, and a few years ago, you know, we saw this big change in the American bankruptcy laws. This used to be a very debtor-friendly country. It used to be pretty easy to rack up a lot of debts and go bankrupt. They made that much harder. So at the same time, you know, the, the policy of cr crashing wages, forcing people to borrow, and then the outlet of bankruptcy has been shut off. And of course, student loan debt, not at all. Uh, you can't discharge that in bankruptcy at all. So um, what I would like to see is a, a real um, a, a restructuring of the sort where wages at the bottom are raised, uh, so people don't, aren't forced to borrow. Uh, people who are in debt now need to have their debts restructured. We need uh, uh, to bring back caps on interest rates, bring back usury laws, uh, uh, reform the bankruptcy law so it's easy to get out of debt if you if you have a problem. Uh, and the, the, just to cut it down to a soundbite, tax the rich and rebuild America. Tax the top 1% or 2% in order to... Uh, build high-speed rail to uh, develop uh, a, a clean energy. You know, I think that that that's a tr tremendous approach to um, um, using economic growth in a way that will actually save life on Earth. And we have this climate crisis at the same time. We have this unemployment crisis. I think we can solve both by developing a very ambitious infrastructure program uh, centered on uh, uh, living sustainably. The next question I I would ask. One thing you raised that nobody has raised so far that I've talked to or heard much is that, you know, people have talked a lot about regulating um, on the creditor end, but not on, not with debtor relief. And really, debtor relief keeps creditors honest. Like you said, with usury laws, with bankruptcy laws, that when those things changed, they were able to get much more risky, I think. Is that... Well, yeah, that, that, that's one thing. Uh, also, you know, these guys, the finance business is, is you know, they talk a lot about the, the, the great free market and laissez-faire, but these guys, whenever they run into trouble, they want to bail out, of course. Right. So they have this business model where they can just be absolutely risky in good times and just go insanely uh, crazy with leverage. And then if they run into trouble, the Federal Reserve will bail them out, the U.S. Treasury will bail them out. And this has been a repeated pattern now for the last uh, 30, 25 years, really, since the 70s and loan crisis, the late 80s. Uh, we've gone through a number of these things where uh, the Mexican crisis of, when was that, 92, 93, 94. Uh, whenever they run into trouble, they get bailed out by the government, and uh, there are no consequences for it. You know, I think we did need some kind of bailout, otherwise we'd all be wearing barrels now. But the, the problem with the bailout as it was structured was that there was nothing, in, nothing demanded in return. There was no regulation, there was no opening up, there was no scrutiny, there was no creation of new kinds of financial uh, institutions. We could have, 
I started saying this way back in the, the savings and loan crisis in the late 80s. We could have created, with some of the institutions the government had bailed out, uh, community-owned, non-profit, cooperative financial institutions that just did basic things like take people's deposits and make basic consumer and business loans. None of this fancy, you know, financial market stuff. Um, and having this kind of non-profit sector that's very sober with very low fees for regular people would put great competitive pressure on the big guys. They would have to change their act too. Uh, they would have to offer be, to, to, in order to maintain. They love having consumer deposits. They're very, very stable and cheap source of finance for them. Um, but um, there, there's no competitive pressure on them to offer a good deal. So now we see, of course, you know, they're raising fees like crazy. They've been raising fees left and right. And now they're, you know, they're trying to raise fees so you can use your debit card. Uh, it's just uh, they, they look to fees now because interest rates are low and they feel like they're not making enough money in interest, so they want to soak people for fees. For poor people, they've just been soaking them. I, I think the... A lot of uh, poor people are paying a thousand dollars a year in things like bounce fees and late fees. Uh, people who can't afford, you know, ten dollars, um, they're, they're being forced to pay these extra fees. Uh, so, so, you know, that that stuff needs to be regulated. But also, I think creating these new kinds of financial institutions, nonprofit, collective, cooperative, publicly owned, they could be owned by the federal government, they could be local governments. There are all kinds of experimentation that we could undergo. But no, all we did was spend hundreds of billions of dollars to try to restore the status quo to what it was before the bust. And that's just a tremendous, you know, was it Rahm Emanuel said, uh, we shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. We did let this good crisis go to waste from our point of view. Like we could have done all kinds of good things. And then, of course, there's no significant re-regulation. The Dodd-Frank thing is really a lot of nothing. And the, the regulations that are being written now to implement it are even weaker than the law itself. So it's just, they, they, they got away with murder. You know, people talk about... Um, ending corporate personhood. I have a lot of problems with that idea. Uh, one of them is that, uh, okay, corporations are persons, and then if they commit crimes, they should suffer like persons. You know, if you commit, if you, if you, if you cheat, if you steal, if you kill, there should be consequences for it. You know, their corporate persons don't suffer those consequences that real persons do when they commit a crime. So what would, I've been trying to ask people in general what their priorities would be, partially to get a sense if um, people in the progressive um, economics world have similar answers. So what would be your priorities? My priority would be to, uh, um, as I, the, the sound I said earlier, uh, tax the rich and rebuild America. And uh, I know that sounds, it's a little more patriotic than I sometimes like to sound. But um, <laughs> I, I think uh, what that means is take a good bit of the money in the top 1% to 2% of the population. Um, you know, maybe not just 1%. We have to get a little more ambitious than that, but not by much. I want to make sure that people who are, have professional incomes, maybe two incomes, don't feel like they're under attack. I want to make sure it's just really focused on plutocrats who've been living too well uh, and tax them in order to build this infra to de develop this infrastructure program, build high-speed rail, uh, do clean energy R&D, do all the kinds of retrofitting of buildings uh, uh, that would really create jobs but also uh, have an impact on, on, on the climate. You know, there's this idea that somehow uh, dealing with environmental um, disaster is somehow opposed to economic uh, – as opposed to prosperity. I mean, there's this false dichotomy that's set up between – uh, growing the economy, as they like to say, and um, saving the environment. I don't believe that's true uh, because, for one, if, the, if, if we have severe climate change, that's really going to ruin the economy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, if we've got floods and uh, um, um, disease and disaster of that sort, that's not really good for, for uh, the economy in any sense. Uh, so that this, you know, this kind of Rick Perry argument that you know, get the bureaucrats out of the way so we create jobs is just insane. It's wrong. It's, we're, we'll, we'll die. You know, life as we know it will end. Uh, but I also think that we can use this opportunity uh, to uh, develop really long-term uh, um, industries, uh, uh, solar. Um, um, there are many other things that we could do, uh, clean energy that we could uh, develop that would create whole new industries. And, you know, it might put the oil industry out of business, but, you know, not too many people outside the oil industry would shed a tear if that happened. Um, so that, that that's that's my priority is to really, like, Develop this infrastructure program, but also relatedly, you know, we got schools that are falling apart. Uh, people have uh, 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 unemployed people have no job support, no income support when they're unemployed. You know, the, the unemployment benefits run out. Unemployment benefits, as they are, just what about 
just a little under $300 a week on average. You can't live on that. Uh, we need more generous income supports. We need a single-payer health care system because you know, the uh, people just – well, we got 50 million people without insurance for the whole year last year. That's just a, a crime. Uh, it would also uh, improve the economy if people weren't so uncertain and if corporate, uh, small businesses were not so burdened with health care costs. So uh, my, my, my priorities then, I think, would be infrastructure and uh, income redistribution, income support, and stabilization. I think we could make education free from kindergarten to Ph.D. in this country for not very much money at all. Uh, that, I think, would be approaching the student debt problem over the long term. And a lot of people in this movement are very concerned about being unemployed and deeply in debt. Uh, those debts need to be reduced or wiped out in some cases, uh, but um, for the future, we need to uh, 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 make sure that people can go to college and not have to pay a lot of money. In New York, we had the City University System of New York was free from 1843 to 1975. It educated a lot of people, did a wonderful job. Um, it's still a wonderful institution, but now it's gotten expensive, and we could we could get back to that. It's not not impossible. Uh, so, you know, the, just those basic kinds of welfare state measures would be very nice to have decent income support, uh, single-payer health care, and free education. And that would almost seem like we'd, you know, died and gone to heaven uh, compared to what we're used to now. Um, so, yeah, th th those would be my priorities, getting those things uh, and then you know, regulating the financial system so these guys don't wreck things again. There's a, an entry by an old Wall Street economist, Albert Wajnalauer, in the in financial Dis dictionary, the new Palgrave dictionary. Uh, called financial zoos, in which he said it's absolutely necessary to build bars and cages around financiers because without those bars, they'll eat each other and then eat us. Uh, we need to put up some of those bars again because they're they're wild animals. You know, they act in herds and they're very very dangerous when they're uh, allow allowed to roam free, and they're especially dangerous when they're allowed to roam free with a government backstop. You mentioned that. Um you know, you have been talking about these issues for years and years and, you know, with really no political support. I sense in this movement a feeling that um, just a real frustration that we lack the political will to do the things that we know need to be done. And I don't think that that's a particularly radical idea. I think that a lot of people in your position have felt that way for years. Is that... Would you agree with that? Oh, I certainly would agree with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a pretty radical position compared to the rest of the, you know, the country anyway. But what's, what's very cheering is the, the, the the resonance that this movement has found among a broad sector of the population. I was in Times Square yesterday, and we were standing there, and all these double-decker, you know, topless tourist buses were going by, and they're all waving at us, and like, you know, giving us the thumbs up and the V sign. Uh, just regular tourists, you know, from the heartland of America, um, you know, cheering this. It's just not what one expected. Uh, when, when Obama first took, I, I never would, I never could sign on with all the enthusiasm that a lot of people felt for Obama. I thought he was going to be a disappointment. And I actually thought at the time that that disappointment might lead to something good. It might, might be people who think it's not just about the personality or the party. There's something deeply structurally wrong here. It took about two and a half years for that perception, I think, finally to get uh, reach broad, uh, broad acceptance. But I think we're getting to that point where people um, who uh, hoped, people voted in 2008 for what they thought was a more peaceful and more egalitarian world, and they didn't get that. Uh, they've gotten more war and more inequality and massive bailouts. And uh, you know, the president once called bankers fat cats. They haven't forgiven him for that. But other, aside from that little... Um, in felicity of phrase, um, he's just been flattering them and subsidizing them. And uh, I, I think people have just reached the point where they, they, they're, they're tired of it. And it was frustrating that much of the, um, the non-mainstream political energy was coming from the right, you know, the, the, the Tea Party movement, uh, who are um, very reactionary and unpleasant people for the most part. And there were certainly people who were had some legitimate grievances, got involved with it, but it was mostly a, a very right-wing, um, older, white, fundamentalist crowd that was behind this with a lot of billionaires um, pulling their strings. Uh, that movement does seem to be burning out a bit, and now all the energy is coming from the good side, and uh, it's very cheering to see that. Now, what the problem you know, in, in, in the medium term is how to transfer that energy to something that can last so it doesn't burn out. Uh, you know, I remember being in Seattle in 1999. It was exhilarating. It was wonderful. 
some of that stuff carried on for a couple of years, and then when the the war happened, it all just died out. Uh, and I, 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 you know, the the people who are in Zuccotti Park and in similar encampments now around the country, um, I can't expect them to like develop an elaborate agenda or some kind of organization. It's you know up to the rest of the population to do something like that. But um, we do need to find some way to take that energy and make it into something that lasts and something that can really change things, it could put pressure on power to change things. Uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, a lot of Democratic politicians feeling that they have to react to this. Uh, they're being forced at least to say the right thing, if not do the right thing. My wife, uh, she said the other day, um, this is the first time in her life that she could remember uh, that uh, politicians felt they had to co-opt a movement from the left. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting to see that happening right now. Uh, but we want to, first of all, make sure it doesn't get co-opted by Nancy Pelosi, um, but also make sure that it just doesn't fizzle out um, and make sure that you know, uh, one of the promising things is to watch what some of the unions are doing. And the unions have been you know, politically dead for a long time. Uh, they're frightened and very conventional and unwilling to upset things. And now they're acting, they're showing some signs of energy, particularly, you know, the rank and file may not be putting pressure internally on the union leadership to get involved. So, you know, if that, if that sector wakes up, you know, if some of the more progressive establishment politicians wake up, uh, this could really develop, but we have to find some way to keep this pressure on and keep this movement going, keep the enthusiasm going. It's hard to maintain that level of enthusiasm for too long, but, you know, some, we have to find some way to institutionalize it without stifling it, without, you know, suffocating it. It's, it's hard to do, but, um, it's absolutely essential if we want this thing to make a difference. Yeah, I think that, uh, Naomi Klein has kind of said a similar thing also with comparisons to 1999 Seattle and the WTO and what happened when 9-11 came along, um, and that, you know, she said, and it's still it's still somewhat vague, but that, you know, you needed to establish organizational roots um, in some way, you needed to be able to make this into something that will sustain. Um, yeah, we need to find some way, organization that's flexible. You know, it's not like some old kind of sectarian Leninist party or something like that with, you know, very elaborate hierarchy and, and you know, very rigid structures. But we need something that has some kind of structure, some kind of institutional force, something that can last beyond the moment. And uh, developing that kind of flexible but durable institution is a major challenge. And I think we really need to think about that and talk about that. I was involved in a, a very contentious debate the other night in New York uh, uh, between um, it was basically two or three people who might be considered more traditional leftists versus a couple of anarchists. And... We argued a lot. It was pretty heated. Um, but I think that debate really needs to be had in the open. And a number of people in the audience uh, commented that you know, they hadn't heard anything like this. Some of them were a little uncomfortable by the level of, 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 of dispute. Um, and a lot of people said there's just nothing like that going on in the General Assembly conversations in Zuccotti Park. Um, but I think that that conversation really needs to be had you know, between people who think in that you know, the, the anarchists were saying that just the practice is enough. Just being in the park is enough. They're developing a new way of living just by being there. I don't really buy that. I don't think that that's going to last. And the police could clear out the park, and then what happens? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think one of the things I've learned from looking to anarchists is that you know we need something structures that are not ossified. We need something that's that's really democratic and accountable, flexible and lively, and not you know, just this oppressive, tedious structure that a lot of traditional parties have had. So I think that's a very important conversation to have and a very important thing to think about, uh, as well as the agenda, you know, that, that, you know, this organization and agenda, how you develop those things without stifling the energy, it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge. Yeah, I, I think that I've, I've appreciated your writing, that it's changed, um, your opinion about the movement has cha have changed as, you know, this very short amount of time, which things seem to be going so quickly. Um, and as have mine, as I'm sure have people, you know, watching from the outside. And you've become, in general, I think, more hopeful about what might be able to come out of this. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, this is the most hopeful I've felt politically in, in quite some. You know, the, the, the Seattle moment was tremendous. You know, I remember standing there in the streets of Seattle and talking to some friends of mine. I, I was with, with some people from the Nation magazine at the time. We were doing the radio show from there and writing it up. And we just looked at each other. Uh, a friend of mine about my age looked at me and said, you know, they're smarter than we were, talking about, you know, the, the, the 60s, uh, a little a little younger than the 60s, but not much. Uh, and... Um, you know, it's just the sense that something new was happening and, you know, that it was very exciting to be there. Um, and I came back, I remember giving a report to a, a, a group and some old Leninist said to me, what you're sounding sounds not like politics, but a carnival, you know, I, you know, well, come on, you know, but the durability issue was still a problem. Like, you know, how that, that moment was lost and how could something so I see some similarities now um, between this moment and then, and I, I feel the same uh, you know exhilaration and hope, um, but also having been through that once before, like twelve years ago, I'm thinking mm, we don't want that to happen again. How can we prevent that from happening? How can we channel this into something broader? Now, one interesting difference though is that the Seattle moment, as great as it was, didn't take root with a large portion of the population. Now it does. I mean, I, you just walk around town. Um, I was in a restaurant a couple of weeks ago, um, and these two like business guys, they're like web business guys in the hip district, the meatpacking district in lower Manhattan. And, you know, they're talking about page views and all this sort of stuff that hip business guys talk about. And then all of a sudden they started talking about Occupy Wall Street. Like, where did that come from? A friend of mine ho overheard these two guys in a train commuting in from Westchester to, uh, to Manhattan similar conversations. We hear this sort of stuff all over. My wife overheard somebody in the, in the street in our neighborhood in Brooklyn the other day saying, wait a minute, your mother's been to Occupy Wall Street and you haven't? And mm -hmm. what's wrong with you? Um, so like, you just hear regular people who have no history in politics like having these conversations, and it's very fruitful. Another thing, you know, I, was, I interviewed a bunch of people early in the occupation, and very few of those had any kind of political history. They were not... You know, people who are veterans of protests. They had just seen some stuff on the web. They've been watching the videos and saying, man, I'm broke, I'm unemployed, I have $20,000 in student debt, I'm going to go down there and just try to do something. Um, it's, it's, it's driven by a sense of necessity um, and urgency. The Seattle moment was, you know, at the end of a long period of relative prosperity. Uh, and this is the exact opposite. This is people, a, a movement born of... Um, desperation and anger and um, we've had 10 or 12 more years of the plutocrats having their way and getting richer um, that was just one difference between the late 90s and now is that in the late 90s there was extremely broad income growth almost every demographic group almost every level of the income distribution saw real wage gains in the late 90s that's not true now the only people who've been doing well for the last 10 years are the very rich everyone else has been lucky to get by I and mean, it's a very different um, economic and political moment, and that's why it does have the promise to take root in a broader uh, uh, um, base of the population, but how to do that and how to translate this enthusiasm and this conversation into actual organization and pressure and something that could really transform this into a better society. Yeah, do you, something we discussed, I discussed earlier with Kevin Gustel of Fire, Fire Dog Lake was whether you thought that this general impetus um, in terms of, I don't know if it's a movement yet, whether to call it a movement, but uh, is related to Wisconsin, what happened in Wisconsin, if there's a connection. There's certainly some connection. You know, the Wisconsin thing, there are a couple of things. I happened to be in Madison just when that started. <laughs> it was just by accident. And it was quite amazing to be there, to see that happen. You know, in New York, we can't get close to City Hall. Uh, ever since Giuliani, City Hall has been surrounded by gates and cops, and you can't right. get... And to, it was just amazing to be able to walk into the state capitol building and chant. I mean, for, so that was just an amazing moment for somebody from New York. But um, that that sense, it was not spontaneous, even though it looked that way. I think some of the unions, the state AFL-CIO in, in Wisconsin did have something to do with organizing it. So it wasn't just, didn't come out of nowhere the way this, this thing sort of came out of nowhere. But the other problem is that because of the absence of um, any kind of alternative organization, the 
union bureaucrats and the Democratic Party were able to channel all that energy into um, electoral politics and the recall movement. And now I think it's kind of fizzled out. So I think the same anger and desperation uh, has motivated the upsurge, um, but we don't want to see that same kind of um, 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 derailing of the movement into um, more democratic politics. I think a lot of Democrats would like to use this movement uh, as a kind of cheering section uh, for themselves. You know, you see, like, even somebody like Van Jones, who is a very skilled and sophisticated guy, but his politics are kind of questionable sometimes, wants to channel this. What it's going to mean is get channeled into the Obama re-election campaign, and get channeled into Democratic congressional campaigns. So we don't want that to happen. You know, we may have to deal with Democratic politicians. Uh, we may want them to pass better laws, but we don't want to become their cheering section. You know, we want to force them into doing the right thing rather than um, um, uh, just becoming you know, part of their campaign. Well, uh, Franklin Roosevelt famously said, you know, you know what, after talking to a, a, a group, you know, uh, you know, now go out and make me do it. Um, right. you know, this, is the, this is the group that's got to make them do it, uh, but we don't want to become you know, their, their, their fundraisers or their, um, their, their door knockers or all those terrible things. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting the sense that a lot of the younger people, um, the 20-somethings that are involved in this movement, uh, felt were maybe some of them were anti-war and felt that that, that movement got funneled into you know, support of the Democratic Party in a way that they don't want to see happen again. Yeah, I actually interviewed a sociologist a while back who did a study of uh, the people of anti-war demonstrations and where did they all go? Like, why was the anti-war movement so populous and then not so populous? And what he found was that the Democrats stopped going. Uh, when Obama became president, Democrats stopped going to these demonstrations. So as, when I was at Times Square yesterday, I was looking around at the people and I thought, I think a lot of these people are Democrats. They're here. Right. right. And, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of people who were at Times Square yesterday don't look like they go to a lot of demonstrations. You know, there was certain. There's this guy, this large man in a teamster jacket, who was, you know, he's not not the kind of shiftless hippie that Ann Coulter says the protesters are. You know, this guy was just a, a working class guy with his um, with a teamster jacket on, and uh, it's a different group of people. And I bet, you know, I bet he's a Democrat. I bet a lot of the other people I saw were Democrats, and uh, it's really great to see them now um, organizing outside the electoral arena, so much of politics gets, you know, especially if it's in a year divisible by four, gets channeled into electoral politics. You no, know, elections are important. The state is very important, obviously. Right. But you know, I think people need to think more about pressuring elected officials to do the right thing rather than getting so deeply involved in campaigns themselves. You know, if, if elected officials feel... Uh, in New York here, uh, when... Um, um, the other day when it was rumored that uh, Bloomberg is going to clear out Zuccotti Park, uh, people called like crazy, called the mayor's office. But he's also lobbied by a bunch of politicians, people in the city council and state legislature, who said, don't do this. This movement has earned such uh, moral authority now that Bloomberg, who is, I think, a little more respectful of civil liberties than his thuggish predecessor, Giuliani, uh, uh, just felt like he couldn't do it. He was he felt like his hands were tied. He couldn't launch the crackdown that he probably wanted to launch. Now this is a guy I remember who said a few weeks ago that if we don't do something about unemployment in this country we're gonna have riots and had his police department go over and talk to the people in London about what happened there. So I mean he had this in his mind. Um but that the the, the moral authority and energy of this movement has forced some of the more decent mainstream politicians to feel like they have to at least defend it mm -hmm. uh, rather than attack it. And that's the kind of thing we need to see, you know, just this kind, of, this kind of energy outside the electoral arena that forces elected officials to do the right thing. Uh, go out and make me do it. These people are going out and make them do it. But right. we just need more of it and uh, uh, more of it for a long time. One of the more consistent things I think you'll hear is people concerned about money in politics? Um, do you think it's important that those that there be some kind of campaign finance reform or whatever? Oh, absolutely. You know, that's really essential to the way you know, business runs the government. They, they just buy. And, and Congress comes very cheaply. It doesn't cost much to, to buy a politician. You know, Wall Street 
there was one study that came out a couple of years ago from Public Citizen that reported, I think it was over the course of a decade, Wall Street spent something like $5 billion on lobbying in Washington. Right. $5 billion for most of us is an awful lot of money. $5 billion for Wall Street is not a lot of money. You know, right. Goldman Sachs' bonus pool in one year is three or four times that. Uh, and that's just one bank in one year. So they can, they can buy the political process very cheaply. And uh, they have to be stopped from doing that. So, you know, we need public uh, financing of elections, real limits on lobbying, uh, and, you know, obviously the Citizens United decision is a, a nightmare. But uh, you're a lawyer, right? So you know more about this than I do. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's absolutely essential um, right. to, to, uh, to, to clean up the government. One question I have Has it changed the conversation in your field already? Oh, completely. Well, you know, my field right. is um, this. I've been writing about money and uh, money and politics for a long time, uh, and uh, like I said earlier, I often felt like it was, it was really lonely. Uh, you know, it's funny to see people like responding to like charts of, uh, of the income distribution and, and, and wages and these sorts of things. You know, I've been running charts like this in my newsletter for 25 years, and but now it's, 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 it's achieved a level of salience, as the pollsters say, that uh, is really, what, what's really changed is just the, the broad recognition of this, the fact that people now feel it in their guts. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, the Republican pollster, uh, Frank Luntz, uh, is famous for saying, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. Uh, and I feel like I've been saying these things, but now people are hearing. The, the, what people are hearing now is very different, and it's just um, it's wonderful to see. Uh, and um, I think that, you know, clearly the time was right for it. Um, right. There was this tremendous political vacuum. We have this financial and economic crisis, the worst of 75 years. And for a long while, it seemed like there was really no political reaction except one coming in the far right. And uh, now that's, that's changed, and it's... Um, it, it, it's, it's quite wonderful. It took, it took time, but it really seems to be happening, and uh, I think it really is, is reshaping the political landscape. So, yeah, people are talking about these things that used to be the uh, concern of specialists, and now it's become a very broad issue. And it's, you know, you look back in the populist era of the late 19th century in this country, uh, and farmers were studying monetary theory uh, and having debates about how to organize uh, the banking system. Uh, and, uh, we're not back there yet, but it, we're, it, this is the direction this seems to be going in. Um, you know, I don't always agree with what people say around this movement, but it's wonderful to be having these conversations. Do you have a sense that, at least in the progressive econo blogosphere, that there's agreement about the types of things that would need to be done if those things were politically possible? Well, I think broadly so, yeah. I mean, some of the things I said about uh, taxing the rich, raising wages, rebuilding the infrastructure, doing the long-term energy, uh, clean technology stuff, I think there's agreement on that. A lot of people, more people will get you know, geeky about financial regulation and talk about bringing back Glass-Steagall and these sorts of things. Um, I didn't talk about that so much, but I think that's that's essential. But I think, it, you know, my, my comrades and colleagues would have – not a very difficult time coming up with a, a broad agenda that we'd, we'd agree on. Um, that, that's not the problem. The problem would be uh, to get it adopted. Um, right. And, you know, there's also, there's still a deep conservative streak in the American population. So even though um, we, we, we're seeing the spreading, there's also still an awful lot of people who uh, are deeply individualistic and um, don't want to mess too much with regulation. I had felt like with the financial crisis in 2008, that economists were somewhat taken aback by the fact that there was so much disagreement among them, that they thought, I mean, you, I felt like I could almost hear uh, Paul Krugman's head snap when John Cochran started making Treasury View type arguments, yeah. and there, <laughs> there was kind of a surprise at how much disagreement there was. Um, well, I, the mainstream of the economics profession and the economic punditry, um, they're, they're still in the 19th century. It's just amazing to see all this pre-Keynesian stuff coming out and I, how marginal a lot of Keynesian-style thinking is, much less than anything to the left of Keynes. Uh, it's been a, a kind of a mystery to me to, to hear this because you know, the, the economy, the, the stimulus package, as weak as it was, kept things from going completely down the drain. And without that, you know, we'd be in dire straits right now. And 
but a lot of people say, oh, it didn't work. Um, or look, you know, things didn't get it so bad, so we didn't really need it. Well, one of the reasons that things didn't get so bad is because we had it. So uh, it, it just, uh, but the, the 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 way people have like reverted to 19th century modes of thought, what, what Keynes mocked as the Treasury view, um, it, it, it's just amazing to see that returning now, uh, and uh, to see um, um, so much embrace of austerity. Uh, the British government, you know, insane. Um, you know, as I'm surprised to the New York Times saying an editorial the other day, it's imposed this quack remedy on itself, uh, budget cutting, uh, and now the economy is just falling to pieces. Uh, well, look what's, what Germany is putting the periphery of Europe through, uh, the austerity programs. Um, Germany, whose banks financed the bubble in the periphery of Europe and now is like insisting that they uh, pay some moral price for it. Um, uh, it's just, it's, it's amazing to watch that. Um, I'm just and, then coupled, and, and coupled with hard money. Yeah, um, absolutely. No, just tight money. I mean, the Germans are just, uh, this great phrase, I think Dennis Healy coined, sedomonetarists. Uh, and, <laughs> right. Uh, That's but, a great uh, phrase. We're seeing that in Europe, and, but also the political confusion in Europe is amazing to watch. They just cannot get their act together at all. Um, right. uh, it's just it's 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 stunning, really, to to see this economic crisis that they can't really seem to do anything about. Uh, and then you know the or the orthodox thinking in this country is also frightening. Uh, but I'm hoping that at least a popular movement might force people to 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 uh, to, to wake up and think a little bit more um, than than they have been. Um, but you now, if we had anything like uh, the Republican wish list enacted, uh, we'd be you know it'd be 19. 37. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny that Obama came into office saying, we knew, we know we're not going to repeat 1930. We're not going to repeat that mistake again. And now they're talking as if they are. And all the people in his administration, his advisors who were pro stimulus, particularly like uh, Christina Romer and even Larry Summers, who's not my favorite guy in the world, but he's been right. saying the right things lately. They left. And the people who are left or, you know, the, in the administration are the Wall Street Orthodox, uh, uh, let's just stroke finance and uh, and uh, balance the budget kinds of people, and that's that's a little scary politically. I'm hoping this movement changes that conversation uh, somewhat, but uh, they they do seem to have the upper hand at least in elite opinion circles. I'd have to go back and look. I don't know. I remember Geithner specifically referencing Japan, and I've been thinking so. 1997 would be the Japanese equivalent of not, of the 1937 mistake, and but. Now I wonder, was he thinking about something different? Was he talking about zombie banks? Was he, I mean, you know, I've been so baffled based on what they said early versus what they've, you know, once, when they adopted, when they started talking about austerity, really, and, you know, deficit hawk, probably in 2009, I guess we started to get hints of it. It was really a surprise, and I, I guess one assumes it's coming from Geithner. Well, you know, Obama told David Brooks, or these people told David Brooks in March 2009, I think it was, that uh, we really want to get entitlements under control. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, this was two months after taking office. The economy was still in, in, in total wreck in the heat of crisis, yet they're already thinking about how to cut the budget. Um, and that was not, they didn't have, they had, you know, both houses of Congress, they had high poll ratings, they didn't need to be talking that way, but they did. Uh, and one of the things that oppresses me about Obama in a bad way. Um, is I, I found myself a couple of months ago listening to Ronald Reagan's first inaugural address. For some reason, I have it in my iTunes library. <laughs> and Reagan said, we can't go back to the old ways of doing things. We can't return to the discredited policies of the past. There may be some sacrifice to be made, but we, you know, glorious future tomorrow, basically. It's, uh, 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 and Obama never made that kind of rhetorical break with, with the past. I mean, he... We we'll talk about change in a very vague way, but he never really uh, has differentiated um, his policies from those that went before him. That's true of also foreign policy. I mean, it's, just, it's amazing to see. You know, I thought he'd be even a little better on civil liberties than he's turned out to be. Um, it's, it's amazing to see him continuing a lot of the same Bush policies on, on, on that, but even escalating to some degree. Um, so, you know, I don't know whether it's Geithner's fault. I mean, he's the one who appointed Geithner. Um, and I think it was Ron, in Ron Suskind's book, he says that uh, Sandy Weil had offered Geithner a job at Citigroup uh, just before he became Treasury Secretary. I have a, a Spanish friend who works for a hedge fund who has a very uh, cynical view of politics. And he thinks that um, 
all these guys are motivated by the desire to get no no work jobs when they get out of public service employment. So, you know, Geithner wants to go work for – Rubin went to – became the, co- the co-chair of Citigroup after he left office. Um, and I don't think Rubin is a corrupt guy. You know, he came out of Goldman Sachs before, so he wasn't exactly – didn't have to be seduced to the financial way of doing things. But I think, you know, a lot of these guys have this in mind. If I don't step on their toes, they'll give me a nice job when I get out of here. And uh, I think there's something to that. I mean, that, that – uh, yeah, perhaps we need tighter restrictions on post-government employment options for, for a lot of these characters. Right, right. Yeah, they they are all intertwined, including the ratings agencies, the central banks, you know, et cetera, and on and on. Yeah, I mean, one of the great ways to get a job on Wall Street is to uh, um, just spend a couple of years working for a, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, spend a right. couple of years in New York Fed uh, and... Uh, you know, they do a lot of good work empirically, actually. A lot of the, empir- the ec- economic work that comes out of the Federal Reserve is, is actually pretty interesting. But uh, it's very easy to spend a couple of years there, and then you go to work for Goldman Sachs. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a finishing school for Wall Street. And that, that those sorts of revolving doors and that creation of, uh, uh, of a governing class, you know, these people are just, they find it very easy to, they feel this affinity with each other. You know, you go back to Roosevelt in 1936, talking about, Never has a politician been so hated by the rich. I welcome their hatred. Right. Obama craves their love and approval, and it's just a, it's, a, it's a very different environment. Maybe that's because Roosevelt was something of an, was an aristocrat and had the confidence and didn't feel the need to please the rich and powerful, the way a more upwardly mobile guy like Obama does. But uh, and you know, also the political environment is different. Roosevelt had to worry about uh, all sorts of domestic unrest. Uh, right that uh, at least until now, Obama has not been under any kind of pressure. Uh, it's interesting to see him now talking a little bit differently. Whether he's going to behave differently, I don't know, but he is talking somewhat differently now than he did before. Right. Well, after, after 2008 and, and the divergence of economists' views, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to double-check and make sure everybody is on the same page <laughs> with uh, policy proposals. I don't know that I necessarily trust that everybody is. And so I am interested to find everybody's priority. And I think on the left, there's some broad agreement on some basic things. Um, so is there anything else you would like to finish with? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, the, the, the message I would like to uh, just deliver to anyone you know, who's listening to this, I'm, I'm sure a lot of uh, um, people who don't really know much about economics and finance are, are tuning in and trying to figure these things out. Um, and, you know, it is it can be very, very complicated, um, but you know, some of the, the basic class angles are not at all very complicated. Um, the financial markets are about the assertion of power and uh, the uh, appropriation of wealth. Um, and... Uh, it's, it's, it's easy for people uh, in positions of authority to try to make it all, it's like, you know, oh, it's just so complicated. You know, the kids can't understand this. They're very patronizing about that. I, there was a piece in, in, in the, uh, the New York Times the other day saying, bankers think, oh, the kids, you know, these kids are just so unsophisticated, they don't really understand. And, yeah, it's really hard to understand what an inverse floater or a collateralized debt obligation is. And Actually, there are only a few hundred people in the world who really can understand a lot of those derivatives, but... Um, the fundamental politics of it are pretty simple, and um, what I would like people to do is just to, to, to maintain some de- that, that that sense of, of, of class resentment and um, 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 hostility and skepticism towards the rich and powerful, uh, but also um, really think about how uh, to create some kind of lasting organization and some kind of um, broad agenda that will um, actually to lead towards transformation of this into a, a better place. American life can be kind of awful sometimes, and we need to, to make it a lot better. Um, you know, it does seem, for all its problems, this was a very dynamic society for a very long time, um, and uh, it was often brutal and ugly uh, and cruel, but there was a dynamism to it, and now it just seems to have lost a lot of energy. It's become, like, dull or the the culture just isn't as much fun as it used to be. There's just something listless and lifeless that's um, made American life um, um, kind of dispiriting in a lot of ways. And um, it's really nice to see this kind of energy happen um, because it's, it's a nice antidote to that feeling of listlessness and hopelessness. Um, and, uh, you know, 
polls show that um, many Americans are despairing of the future, um, which is a very unusual thing for this country, which has historically been very optimistic and, and, and very forward-looking. Uh, that's not my temperament necessarily. Um, perhaps I have a gloomy or Teutonic temperament or something. But um, it's really nice to see a return of that sense of possibility. So I mean, the, the combination of... Um, Class antagonism uh, combined with a spirit of um, um, fun and solidarity and um, optimism about the future. It's wonderful, and I hope we can sustain this and transform it into something that really lasts, really matters. Well, thank you so much. Was the interview, was the debate taped? Yeah, I think they're editing it. I think say they're editing it to uh, in an M uh, OVH1 pop-up video style. I have no idea what it means, but I think they have ambitions to make this a fun video and not just some verite thing. So, uh, oh, very good. It's supposed to be All right, well, I'll, soon. I'll make sure to link that. Okay. Uh, and also uh, your book on Wall Street. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. For, it was so thanks. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.